So there's just a few procedural matters before we get going. As our guest speaker is present here with us, you can raise your hand to ask a question and I'll be able to see it on, on Zoom. Um, you appear on the screen. Um, now, the, the raise hand mode is a, an app down the bottom uh, that uh, I've got to always look at this, whatever they are, uh, in the reactions. And there's a lot of reactions, but there's a raise hand one. If you raise your hand, we'll hopefully see you and uh, get you to ask your question. Just remember that after you've asked your question, unraise your hand by clicking on it again. Otherwise, we'll keep referring you to ask questions. For those who uh, are the present, if you've not already done so, Choi is out there happily selling raffle tickets. So you can buy a raffle ticket and win a monstrous prize that we'll draw after the break. So our agenda for the night is first, you will have our guest speaker, Greg Keogh. Following Greg's talk, we'll have a 30 minute break where members present will be able to have a little time to socialize and partake of some refreshments. Uh, I believe they're providing some light entertainment for those that are staying at home. Um, I was watching the Roadrunner the other day, and I don't know whether they've got any Roadrunner cartoons for you to watch, but uh, it's just a suggestion. Then following the break, we'll have our President Hugh McDonnell give his report, after which Stuart Grunnickley, from iHelp, uh, will uh, give a report on iHelp's uh, activities and uh, maybe answer any questions that you have. And at the formal closing of the meeting, Zoom will be left open for a while. So if you want to have a bit of a chat amongst yourselves, I'm not sure how long it'll be left open for, but uh, just keep talking as long as you wish until they shut it down. And for those members present, if you wish to go to the Waffle Sig at Fong's, uh, that's where we'll be heading after the meeting. Or if you're at home and live close by, you can still go to Fong's. So I'd now like to welcome Greg Keogh. Greg is a software developer in real life, but he has many nerdy hobbies that include astronomy, computing, music, movies, science fiction, and the history of mathematics. I don't know if he'd have time for much else with all that. In this presentation titled Huge Numbers, Infinity and Beyond, he discusses the history of the the concept of infinity. You will then learn why Buzz Lightyear's movie catchphrase to infinity and beyond is not quite as funny as the writers intended. You will see numbers so large they confuse mortal minds. You will learn how to fit an infinite number of guests into a hotel with an infinite number of rooms that are all full. I've struck that before. You will learn of paradoxes that might make you doubt reality exists so over to you thank you greg oh, thank you so we'll wait oh straight on no gap okay here we go it's great to be back in front of a, a live audience but where is everybody they're all on zoom are they but there's a, for those of you at home there's only about a dozen people here and i was really hoping for a lot of audience participation so I'll have to stretch it out a bit. <laughs> so 30, 30 online we've got, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. Right, I should start. I think it's tradition you start with a little bit of a promo about yourself. I'm actually, a, um, as you said, I'm actually a software developer. I caught the computer software bug at the age of about 17 or 18 or something back in the 1970s. And I actually started writing software professionally in about 80-ish, and it's been non-stop since then. And so, I, as you can tell, after all that time, I'm still writing software, so I really got the bug. And um, I, I never went into management or anything like that, because uh, now we're called software engineers, you may know. In the old days, I was called a computer programmer. Remember that? Yeah. And to be honest, the name of software engineer is probably more re realistic these days, because writing software is really hard. I'm telling you, getting harder and harder. Question already? A coder. Oh, I want to be one of those 10 times coders. You heard of them? They're supposed to be 10 times better than every other coder. You can, you, you can find YouTube videos of people claiming to be 10 time coders. Yeah, that's my dream. Yeah, um, that's me in my normal 
um, modes of operation here. That's, that's me having a meeting with Spot. I've got a couple of websites. Um, just to prove to you how nude I am. Look, look, I've got a, I swear, can they see me on the, I'm, oh, hang on. Can, can, oh, can, a couple of things. I've got to put this in my pocket. Hang on a second, everybody. That goes there so I can walk around. And I can't see myself on the screen there because there's a, a pop-up got it thing. There. Yeah, that's all right. Fix that. So one of the things, one of my hobbies is ever since I was a kid was um, uh, chemistry and I love the, the, the periodic table. So I've actually collected about 55 of the elements. That's my shelf, my proud collection of elements there. Uh, this, <laughs> this is my, one of my bookshelves full of maths, chemistry, physics, and, and astronomy books. And here's another one. This is, this is more, more or less my working shelf where I'm looking up all the time. Now, if that isn't proof I'm a, an IT and a science nerd, I think that's about it. <laughs> right, now, here we go. You're ready. As the intro said, um, when I thought of doing this talk, the first thing that came to mind was Buzz Lightyear, and that, that's 20 years old now, but when I came up with that, um, that uh, catchphrase for Buzz Lightyear to infinity and beyond, the, uh, the marketing people must have thought it was hilarious because they... I thought, ah, oh, some of the public will understand the joke about infinity and going beyond infinity. Oops, I've got to move around. I'll move around. I'm getting the, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but others, and, and I'm sure some some people in the public did get the joke and went, oh, it's pretty funny. We, we need you to share the screen. Share the screen. Who said that? I did. Okay, share the screen. It's not for me to do, is it? Can you look after that? Or guys up. Uh, guys up in the control booth up there? Anyway, I'll let them sort it out. I'll keep going. But there are some people in the public who've looked at this and must have gone, uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Ooh, that's... Ah, okay. Can they see it okay? They want to see the actual presentation. Is there a quick fix for that, or I'll just go ahead? All right, I'll, people can still see, can they? Yeah. That's all right. Look, I'll just go ahead anyway. All right, I'll, I'll move around. No, we can't see the screen. Someone on Zoom. You. Yeah, that was you said that. Can somebody spotlight his image? I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah, now it's That's now better. it's okay. What's the status now? Oh, it's okay now. Yeah, Did somebody better. say that? Anyone? Is it okay now? Yes, it's okay now. Oh, beauty. Okay. There's one downside of that, though. Now, is that I like to walk up to the screen and point at it, and I can't do that on the um, when you when you're looking directly at the, the digital image. But I go ahead anyway. Right now, here we go. So, oh, so later you realise why it's not quite as funny as it was intended, right? Now, just one boring slide to start with um, ancient history, because there's not much of it. The, the concept of history uh, of infinity is a uh, relatively modern one. Um, the, Hel the Hellenic Greeks, these guys here, next Amanda, they tried to avoid using any concept of infinity. They used all sorts of um, strange expressions like this. This is the guy who proved there was infinite prime numbers. You yeah. might have learned this in high school. And, um, but he used the expression, any assigned multitude, because they were all basically too scared to use whatever the closest word was to infinity. That was, that was a very unpopular concept. Uh, though Zeno was um, quite happy with the concept and he came up with one of his famous paradoxes and that is that uh, there's Achilles and the tortoise having a race and the tortoise has a 10 meter head start. Bang, they, off they go. Achilles gets to where the tortoise was and the tortoise has advanced um, a few more meters. Then a short time later, Achilles has got to where that tortoise was then, but he's moved on a little bit further and on and on and on. So the bet is, if this is the way it works, Achilles will never catch the tortoise. He'll just get closer and closer and closer and never get to him. But in modern terms, if you're a high school student, would draw it like this. 
that's um that's the that's the um speed and position of the tortoise and this is Achilles catching up to him so what, what Zeno was actually doing is measuring this gap in here and getting smaller and smaller and smaller but in real life as time progresses linearly he will pass the tortoise so the, the moral of the story is that anybody can divide something into infinite number of parts and that's what Zeno was doing chopping it into infinities smaller and smaller and smaller the first use of infinity is John Wallace. He's a very famous mathematician. He's one of the, the average public don't know him, but if you're a bit of a hobbyist like myself, he's one of the big names, one of the early ones. Uh, did, did a lot of work in a lot of fields. Uh, and now he, he was the first to in, introduce the, um, the symbol. And I've put this up here for the IT geeks because I'm very keen on Unicode characters. You, you people, uh, most people know about Unicode. It's an international standard for encoding all characters on earth in all languages. Yeah, there's a few nods there, that's right, yeah. Very important in um, computing when you're writing software <clears throat> because your, your code has got to be Unicode enabled because um, I've had to do things previously like write some software which is simultaneously in uh, Korean, Danish, French and English. You know, so you've got to have these different files of um, uh, translations of all the text on your screen in them and they've got to be Unicode enabled. So I'll pop those up for the geeks. Is there anybody, uh, anybody here? Does anybody, any programmers amongst the audience, the live audience or the Zoom <coughs> audience? Um, there's one, two programmers here, part-time hobbies here. What sort of language? Is anybody write Python, JavaScript? Fortran 4. I wrote <laughs> some of that too in 1978. Oh, forgive me. Forgive me. <laughs> yeah. LaTeX. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just before we... I'm going to do some popular culture stuff about um, infinity. Who remembers Colchak up there? Darren McGavin. He has an infinity on his um, on his gravestone. It's very popular, apparently. And I read somewhere that James Dean has one on his gravestone. And I found pictures of James Dean's uh, headstone, but I can't see infinity on it. So I still can't. I can't verify that. Um, here's um, uh, Ferris Bueller up here. Was in a movie called Infinity, where he played Richard Feynman, a great physicist, um, very sadly missed, great educator, great guy, all around guy, uh, very influential. He was involved in the uh, the investigation into the Challenger shuttle oh, he, uh, um, disaster. Yeah, that's right. He was. I think he had the committee. They all trusted him so much. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that movie was called Infinity because. Being a physicist, they tend to not deal in, infin in infinities, so that's rather strange. Uh, the infinity chamber, I haven't seen, but it turns out it's a cop out. It's actually about some sort of high tech prison and a guy escapes from it. There's no infinity in it at all. Everybody knows Avengers Infinity War, but the only infinity in that is possibly boredom and confusion. I'm serious. What a mess of a movie. And I'm serious. I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not scared to say it. I found some kids' movies too, Infinity Train, and that, some of these look really good, but I haven't found copies of them yet, but I'm really keen on that. Uh, this one's more interesting, The Man Who Knew Infinity uh, with Dev Patel, based on the life of um, Ramanujan, Rizavana Ramanujan, <laughs> played by Dev Patel. Uh, he, he comes to England and he's mentored by um, Jeremy Irons <laughs> as playing G.H. Hardy and um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, Toby, Toby, Toby Brown, not Toby Maguire. He's Spider-Man. You know, Toby, it'll come to me. Um, but, um, Hardy and Hardy and Littlewood, he plays um, Littlewood. Hardy and Littlewood were some of the greatest British mathematicians at the time. They were so famous that European mathematicians thought they were one bloke. Uh, Hardy dash Littlewood, but they used to collaborate. Now, keep an eye on him. He'll come back later. You'll see the real guy. No. Ah, popular culture. Here we go. Will this play? Uh, Homer versus Flanders. So who's going to be, who's going to win the mini golf? Oh, you didn't quite hear it, but he says infinity. Infinity plus one. No. Yeah, because you can't beat that. Infinity plus one times uh, it's a little delay there, he said. I hit you infinity plus one time. So it's a little jump there. Uh, some TV shows. Um, I thought infinity was about infinity, but it's not. 
It's actually about someone who has his brain scanned or something and turns into a secret agent. The Infinity Project turns out of a guy who actually swaps his brain with someone else and becomes a secret agent as well. So clearly there's a plot running here. Um, someone tries to take over the, um, this is 1970, 83, I think, this Doctor Who episode, The Ark of Infinity. The, um, somebody tries to take over Gallifrey. Of course, the Doctor saves him. That's right. Interesting too, I noticed they're all got guns. I can't quite figure out what's going on there. Something, Infinity must do something to you. Yeah. <laughs> Books more interesting. Um, David Foster Wallace is a um, he's widely regarded as a genius. With no sarcasm at all. He wrote a book in uh, 1992, I think it was called Infinite Jest, which people regard as being one of the most dense, mind-boggling books you know it, written in the in the in the last hundred years. I didn't know he was a bit of a mathematician as well. He actually did a history of of, um, of infinity. This book, the Georg, Georg Cantor book, will smit Cantor um, soon. He literally is the founder of set theory. He's, he's the god of this talk tonight. He started the concept of infinity and what you could do with it. And we'll, you'll see him come up. It's very important. Asimov, of course, um, was a good educator. Rudy Rucker is um, a really funny guy. He's a physicist in America, writes funny books, uh, um, uh, and he's a good educator as well. He, he puts himself out there. Donald Noose. Oh, we're not worthy. <laughs> Donald Noose. Here he is. He's a, born in 1938, I think. Um, he worked on he worked on every type of mainframe computer as they all as during their during the birth of the mainframe. Um, he's uh, got fantastic stories. He he's he invented whole ways of doing things that we take for granted now that migrate into the PC world. How to sort things. How to migrate. How file systems work. He's a godlike character to programmers. And that I'm very proudly there is my $200 copy of his hardcover box set of this The Art of Computer Programming by Donald Noose. Um, Bill Gates said anybody who can read and understand this book should send their CV straight to him. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. Very sadly here, um, John Conway, who here, um, was one of these brilliant polymaths again. Fun guy again. He used to uh, write computer games and invent computer games. He invented life. I reckon the people here remember the game of life. No, you're old enough. <laughs> I was fascinated by it. And of course, it's played on an infinite grid of cellular automata, as they're called. It's simple rules. And, and oh, very sadly, John Conway died of COVID in 2020. Very sadly missed. Oh, I was I was heartbroken. Didn't make the newspapers though. Yes. Art. The Drost effect. I love that. Who loves getting into an elevator or a lift, a bigger pardon, that's got mirrors all around the sides of it, you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> Who remembers Pink Floyd? Yeah. And uh this is the full action. I noticed uh, this is the original one. It's got the Gigi soundtrack L LP uh, leaning against the wall there. They airbrushed it out on one of the later albums. So that's an old picture. Yayo Kusuma is a strange Japanese lady. She actually admits she's a little bit weird in the head in some way. This is not being diagnosed, but no, she said it. And she's obsessed with dots. And she makes a a artwork like this with infinite mirrors and dots. They're all quite different and quite uh, hypnotic. I'm very impressed by that. The invention of the, of the perspective that heads to the to the line at infinity was a very important uh, discovery in the in the Renaissance. Because you may recall, if you see medieval paintings, you know everything's sort of flat and out of perspective because they didn't have the concept of infinity or at the horizon back in those days. So, but that, that's not a painting. But you know, paintings that do this, where you uh, they've got the knack of infinity. Everybody knows Escher, I hope. That's a genius of a guy. Yeah, M many of his paintings have some weird form of infinity in, like infinity, like um, waterfalls that flow upwards forever, and those sorts of optical illusions. And the good old Mandelbrot set, yeah, which you can zoom into forever. Borges here, Borges, Borges. I'm not sure how to say his name. Spanish. Two in two really interesting books on infinity. One's almost infinity. He invented the Library of Babel, where there's these cells, these hexagons full of full of um, shelves, books, and pages, all full of 29 different combinations of letters. And every combination possible 
of 29 letters is in the library somewhere. Now, that's not an infinite number. You can calculate it, but that means that the number of these hex rooms in this library is about 10 to the power 2 million. So it's a 2 million digit number. Now, you might think that's a lot, right? But it's, it's, it's peanuts to what you can see later, right? So that's not an infinite library. This story here about a, our, our protagonist buys a book down in a market, a bit like buying a gremlin, and he discovers that every time he opens the book up and he reads a page with an illustration on it, if he turns the page, it's gone forever and a new one replaces it. There are actually an infinite number of pages and he becomes obsessed with it. He's trying to figure out what, 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 what this thing is telling him. And he, he keeps writing down and copying bits of the pages because he never never find them again. So how can you find one page in an infinity number of pages? And, and eventually um, he um, decides that he can't take it and he takes the book down to his local library and puts it in the archive. And that's a bit like Indiana Jones. He figures if he puts the book back in an archive, no one's ever going to find it again, saving himself. So right, here we go. This wave here goes forever. It's called the, right, the Riemann zeta function. In fact, it's so famous, the people at home, the people on Zoom won't be able to see this. It's so famous. Somebody just hold, hold that. Did you get a poster of it? <laughs> That's my printed copy. That's what it looks like. And it stretches to infinity. And it actually, in a very devious way, encodes the prime numbers. I'll just drop it down. And if you play it in stereo, it's not meant to be a sound wave, but it just so happens you can play it. I hit the wrong button. Oh, no, there it goes. That signal will very, very slowly go up to infinity, but it, as it goes up, it slows down and slows down. So it's the most tedious and slow journey to infinity you can imagine. Interesting, there's all those little crackling noises in the background. They're not prime numbers, but it's... <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. So, uh, okay, real music. Um, Richard Strauss, who wrote some epic works, he's a favorite of mine, very sophisticated composer. Um, they stole his music um, for the opening theme of 2001 A Space Odyssey. And that, that opening theme always goes, bum, bum, bum those three notes he's based those three notes uh on he combines them in various ways in, into a 40 minute piece of music called also spark zaratustra which is the whole piece what you've only heard is the opening like minute and a half i love the whole piece and um in one of them he, in one of the pieces he has this theme here which infinitely descends you know you can should be able to hear it now this is the high bit and we'll just keep going like that forever until the musicians faint. <laughs> but, and, but he's such he's such a smarty pants. He did the reverse in another part. He's got an endlessly ascending theme. Here's here's this famous bum bum bum. And he and, he, and what he does is he plays every note of the scale, all twelve notes of the piano scale. And then it goes da 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 da, and it starts again, and it goes through the same sequence. Then it starts again, so it's endlessly rising, um, bum, bum, up and up and up forever. Yeah. A bit more serious now. This is what a typical use of infinity looks like if you look in a textbook or something like that. The top one says, as x goes to infinity, it will then equal one. It won't actually get to one, but after an infinite amount of time, it will. The next one is saying that you will add up from n from one to infinity. You won't get there, but you just keep going. And eventually it will equal infinity. They write that it doesn't actually equal infinity, but it goes to infinity. There's a subtle difference there. Yeah. That is another typical modern usage of the of an infinity. Uh, yes, it looks like a bit infected. When I, last, at Christmas, I bought, and this is why people at home can't see this, but last Christmas, I bought myself a Christmas present, a book called The, Secret, the Secrets of Infinity. Very nice book, lovely color plates, uh, broken into subjects. When I took it to the, uh, I bought this before I knew I was giving this talk. It's completely coincidental. That's what it's geek I am, right? 
I took it to the counter and the young chap there said to me, oh, cool, man, uh, infinity. Oh, that symbol's really popular. He said, it's a really popular tattoo. Uh, I was a bit tired. I didn't really, I didn't have a snappy right post at the time, but at least I was thinking, oh, I wanted to tattoo the Schrodinger equation or the prime numbers on the ring. That'd be a bit more educational, but I haven't seen that happen yet. Well, here we go. This is a bit of a fun bit, all right? Just from, before we get to infinity, we're going to talk about some big numbers. Now, hopefully everybody here remembers that 10 to the power number means one followed by that many zeros. We're all happy with a million. You know, you can, you can picture a million people. A billion, you know, I'll just, there's a few little examples. Man. You know, 8 billion people on the, in the earth. Uh, for computer programmers, anybody who, in most languages like Python and C Sharp, many of the popular languages, Ruby and stuff, if you say, um, define an int, int, int number, it's usually a 32-bit number, which can hold 4.2 billion values, which is good enough for most programming. Although, um, if you have a very large database and you're numbering the rows, and there are databases that have, in, you can imagine in the world, that have more than 4 billion rows in them, or 4 billion entries, you, you, a 32-bit number is not enough. Um, you have to go up to the 64-bit number. Most programming languages will have a, a, a variable called something like long or long int or something like that. That is probably a 64-bit integer, in which case um, you've got 18 quintillion values, 18 zeros followed by it. You're not going to run out of, um, that number's not going to be exhausted in any way at all. So approximate number of ints, no, it's about the number of insects on the earth, they estimate, and no, Rubik's Cube positions, yeah. If you have a 64-bit computer, uh, it actually means something, but it means that the, the hardware, the firmware, the actual silicon in the chips that are actually work in work in 64-bit numbers. It's very efficient, so you can multiply, divide 64-bit numbers in a blink. Okay. Atoms in the human body? Okay, we're getting up there now. We're getting really big. Uh, there is 100... Uh, who's seen... See the black text up there. Who's seen a GUA? Do you recognise those things? They pop up in websites, um, databases. I see them. I see them everywhere. Um, you, you might see them in, sometimes in the footers of web pages and things, but you, your eye probably just skips over them. They're called globally unique IDs, and they're hundred and was it yeah, ten to the thirty eighth power different values can be in it. So the idea is that um, if you, 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 I'll bet if I'll bet everybody in this group who's a member of this of this club probably has a good associated with their name. I'll bet. But you don't see it. It's probably in the database. I'll we'll have to ask the programmer. But, and um, the idea is, if you can generate goods randomly, there is no chance they'll ever collide anywhere in the world, or not even in the universe, because they were completely different. You, um, just be reminded: if you ever shuffle a deck of fifty-two cards properly, um, the the positions of the cards you finished up with have probably never been seen in the history of the universe before either because there's so many combinations of 52 cards. Now we're hitting the twilight zone now. Around 10 to the 80, 50, uh, 85 is about the estimated limit of the actual number of particles in the whole observable universe. Oops, I just thumped that thing. That's all right. Yeah. Um, so at this point, um, we're leaving the universe behind a bit. So the numbers are now beyond physical reality or known physical reality. And I mentioned at Google because it's so popular. It actually has no practical meaning. There's nothing that's around a Google-ish, you know, but it's a popular number. In, um, and it's, legend has it that one of the interns at Google when the company was still forming uh, misspelled Google, the, the Google, the original name as Google, and it's stuck. Yeah. Right. right, here we go. We're past the, past the size of the universe now. I threw this slide in. Is the universe infinite? Because it's a separate topic. Because we assume the universe is like 13 billion light years across or something, but... Uh, hey. <laughs> now, that, I'd love to talk about that, but there's no time. If anybody's brave and ask, uh, enough to ask a question about that, good go for it. Okay, bit of maths. Very big numbers. Skews number. Prime numbers again. The orange jagged staircase here is the count of prime numbers. You're just tallying prime numbers as you go upwards. We call it the staircase of truth. 
and it's been puzzling mathematicians for hundreds of years, you know, what is the shape of this staircase? Gauss, who's the greatest mathematician of all time, there's not much dispute about that, at the age of 15, <laughs> what were you doing when you were 15? <laughs> at the age of 15, he discovered there was a, um, uh, an approximation to this prime number counter. He knew he couldn't get it exactly right because it's so random and impossible to follow the staircase. Prime numbers are just chaotic, you know, they're completely unpredictable. But, but his estimate is pretty good. As you can see, as you go out on the right here, as you go out to 100, to a million, and to a billion, his estimate is hugging the actual prime number count very closely all the way. And it was proved later that the error shrinks to zero. What, do you have to go to infinity? Again, infinity. Now, most people don't know what log integral is, but it's basically the area under the old traditional, you know, the log graph you used to do in school? It's the area under the log graph. Um, you won't find it in things like log, um, find it like in log tables or anything like that. Like, like well, who in their right mind these days uses log tables? Um, yeah. Okay. You mean in contemporary times? Yeah. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what, where was I? pH level in the chemical industry, they use it to measure. The uh, magnitude of earthquakes, I believe they also use it. Well, they're logarithmic, aren't they? They're logarithmic. It's yeah. um, all computerized, I believe, but they still actually use them. And I've still got my log tables from there. school. I can see you've got a four figure and a five figure there. When I was a kid, yeah. when I got my first five figure log table, I was, I was so, so bugged. Ooh, it's, it's, really, it's really cool to have a five figure table, mm. you know. Yeah, but I remember learning about it at school and I thought, what the hell am I learning this for? <laughs> Look over here, he's got a seven figure log table. Yeah. They're only used by um, engineers and. Yeah. Seven figure ones? Yeah. Ah, okay. Surveyors. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fabulous book, that seven digit one. It's a big, big fat book. Yeah. Take it to bed with you. But if you, if, you want to, if you want to know about more exotic functions other than sine and cos and log and stuff that are in those books, and you want to know about something like log integral, you'll need something like this. I'm holding it up the camera. That's a, this is a log table book that fell, came back with a TARDIS. <laughs> I just, uh, just pass it around. Anybody? Just pass it around. You've probably never seen one. Some of you might have. It's a famous book. Uh, <laughs> good reading. <laughs> Clever. That, that's irresponsible. That could cause a space shuttle crash or a, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, what happened was um, uh, there is now there he is Toby Toby what's his name I said he was in that man who um, man who knew infinity movie. That's the real guy. That's uh, John Edens or Littlewood. He was uh, he's a much bigger fellow than to uh, Toby the actor. He um. Uh, he was an expert uh, cricketer and all-around sportsman. Uh, he worked with Hardy, and they they discovered that um, Ga the great Gauss's estimate, his blue line, actually went oh haywire at some point. This happened. It went it went over and under and overestimated, underestimated the actual prime number count, and this actually stunned people to think that Gauss was wrong. Right? He had a he was a godlike character in mathematics. So the question was on, okay, if this thing crosses over and Gauss's guess is wrong, where does it happen? What's the first point? Uh, he got his student, Stanley Skews here, who was a South African math uh, mathematician living in England, who was actually a rowing partner with um, Alan Turing, another great um, computer name, yeah. Greg, you've got a question from someone, um, yep. David? At home, David, ask your question. Can hear him. The name, hear me, out there. 
Nod if you can hear him. <laughs> Wave. <laughs> no? No? Okay. So, Skews came up with two possibilities for where this magic crossover points happened. There was a, a, a worse and a best guess. So it, so, now, if you look at this number here on the left, which is the most optimistic guess, 10 to, if you took, took from, the, from the top down, 10 to the 34th power is a reasonable number. You can write it down. It's one and 34 zeros. It could be the number of water molecules in Port Phillip Bay or something like that, something like that. But if you take 10 to that power, you've got to write down one followed by 10 to the 34th zeros, which humanity couldn't do. You'd, oh, oh, if every person on earth did it, you'd be, oh, I don't know. But then you take that ridiculous number and then write that many zeros. So this is what's called a, a tower of powers. They turn up quite a lot in maths. So this number was quite famous for a while. I heard about it at the kid. It was one of the largest famous numbers in mathematics. It actually had a useful meaning. And luckily it has been reduced. That crossover point is currently down to around 10 to the 316. So they made a big improvement. At least that's a reasonable number, a 300 digit number. You know, that's, we can deal with that. Um, but unfortunately, as I've said here, it's still far, immensely beyond our computing power. We've only got prime number calculations up to 10 to the 27 at the moment. So getting up to 316, it's, it's science fiction. I don't, computers won't be made of matter or if we ever get to that stage. But that, okay, the, the final big number, I only learned about this one myself about a year or two ago. Graham's number is so big that it, it well, yeah, you can't even write it in this Tower of Power format. It, it won't fit in the universe. My mate, Donald Nuth again, that's my boy. He invented a special notation, this up arrows, to invent numbers that are bigger and bigger in staggeringly huge jumps. So two to the fourth is just to the power four, as you can see, three arrows, push it up to like a tower of 65,002 powers in a stack, which is already a number just beyond idiocy. So Graham's number is actually, you read this from the bottom up, you get the number three, four arrow powers of three, and that number is already so large that it's absolutely absurd. Then you get that number of arrows and put them into there, into the next layer. Then that's an even bigger number. Then you get that number of arrows and put it into all the way up the stack 64 times. The number at the top is Graham's number. It is um, currently regarded as the biggest mind boggling meteoric number that actually has a proper meaning. Yeah. And we know it's the last digits, but I better race through this. All right, mental preparation for infinity. Here we go. David Hilbert, great mathematician. Um, one of the top five of all time, dashing fellow, good educator. Has a hotel with an infinite number of rooms in it and they're all full. Somebody comes to reception and demands a room. What do you do? <laughs> now, I know Charles knows what to do. He's, re he's busy reading his Abraham and Stegen book. <laughs> Hilbert knows what to do. That title there, Gehemna, is the highest honor of a title that a German mathematician can get. That was his title at the time. Here we go. Thanks to Derek for this video extract. You get on the PA and you tell all the guests to move down a room. So the person in room one moves to room two, the one in room two moves to room three, and so on down the line. And now you can put the new guest in room one. If a bus shows up with a hundred people, you know exactly what to do. Just move everyone down a hundred rooms and put the new guests in their vacated rooms. It's true. It's an infinite hotel. Just push everybody down and you've got spare rooms. <laughs> an infinite number of customers turn up and it's full, right? This is easy. The red, the red numbers at the top are all the full rooms. Get on the blower and tell every person to go to the room that's double their number now. So you get this. So all the green ones, one, three, five, seven, nine, they're all empty now. All right. So, and there's an infinite number of odd numbers. So you fit the infinite number of people into the green, endless number of green rooms. It gets worse. <laughs> An infinite number of buses arrive, each containing an infinite number of people. And the hotel's full. <laughs> I made this up, they're all different. Buses contain different types of people, right? There's an answer to this too. What you do is, uh, this is why I wanted audience participation here. But, um, the people at home can't see this. Because what you do is, if the people in the front row here are the hotel guests, we put you in room two, two times two, four, times two is eight. 16, 32, 64 for you. Just times two, times two, times two, times two, right? So you all moved. 
Next row, well, the, what are you? Next row, you're the, uh, the banjo players. You, you go to room three times three, nine, three, 27 times three times three times three times three. Next is five. We can't use four because if I send you to room four, clashes with the twos. Yes. That's right. He's got it. Yeah. So five by five by five by five by five. Likewise, ballerinas in room seven by seven by seven by seven. Yeah. There's no way he's going to find the right word. <laughs> we have helpers. <laughs> The retarded. <laughs> so somebody picked, saw that straight away. What the pattern is? They're all prime numbers, because you have to assign everybody a prime by prime by prime by prime. So there's no clashes. If you use any numbers that divide each other, bingo, they'll collide and collide, and you get. You don't want ballerinas in a room with golfers, right? Certainly. Well, I don't. What could be the worst combination? Mineral mineralogists and banjo players. I don't know. So everybody gets a room like that, and there's no possibility of a clash. And so the infinite number of people in every bus has gone into an infinite number of rooms that were already full. Bingo, it's all done. Uh, some rooms are left empty, unfortunately, like room six isn't used. That's not important. There's a way around that, uh, just, just very quickly. What you do is make a little spreadsheet of all the, all the buses and all the hotel rooms and all the passengers, and you number them like this, room one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, across the diagonals forever. The, the, the people will be jumbled up in their rooms a bit, but every single passenger in every, in every bus will get a room and there'll be no gaps. So that's the super duper way of fixing that problem. Right. So we've, this is what we've learnt from that little exercise with Hilbert's Hotel, that infinity, you can add it, multiply it, whatever, and you're just stuck with infinity again. Right. That's, the, that's the paradox of infinity. Oh, yeah, what do you jump into an imaginary number hotel? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I tricked myself. You know, I, made, I poked fun at Woody before because he, um, he was beyond the infinity and beyond. I forgot that one of my favorite movies actually had that, and Stanley Kubrick used that expression and beyond the infinite. And I forgot, so I was so embarrassed. But I, and I presume Kubrick was also um, didn't quite know what he was saying, it probably just sounded artistic. Okay, we're almost there. This is the home stretch. Now, <laughs> there's some maths coming, but it's not maths. I'm not going to, none of the maths you're going to see now is not trigonometry or geometry or any, anything, or algebra or anything like that. This is what's called set theory. This is the man, Gil Cantor's back again. We saw his book way back on the first few slides. He invented set theory. And, and this is actually what we're doing now with the hotel and the guests and stuff. They're infinite sets. In, in our case, they're sets of numbers. Which is, which is what we want, that's fine. And he even called, he invented the expression countably infinite. Hilbert's hotel, the rooms are countably infinite because every room can be numbered. All these factorials can be numbered. All the even numbers can be numbered. If you can just make a one-to-one -one correspondence between any list you have and the numbers, that's called a bijection, they're countable. And it's so important that he invented this symbol for it, R left naught or null or whatever. And there's a Unicode number. Oh, actually, I should say that that's the R left bit, that naught bit. If you want to put this in a Word document, you'll have to make that a subscript zero. <laughs> there's no symbol for it. And it's a very important symbol because what it means here, and I've said this, it's, it's a cardinal number. It's not a number. It represents the size of a countable infinity. So Hilbert's hotel has RLF null rooms. And it's very convenient for mathematicians to say that. Um, Cantor went looking for an infinity bigger than infinity. He was obsessed with finding one. And he thought fractions, what we call the rational numbers, the fractions. He figured if you even take a little piece of a number line, like from zero to one, there's an infinite number of fractions jammed into that tiny little zero to one gap. Because between every fraction is another one. You just take the average. Then the average and an average. You just so they never the never ending infinity of fractions between any two points in the number line. And he said, okay, this that that's got to be an infinity of infinities. It's got to be bigger than R left null, the our friendly infinity. But he was wrong. Because what you can do using a spreadsheet trick again, 
you can write out every fraction that exists on an infinite spreadsheet. You can see, it goes one, one, two, three, four at the top there, three, four, five, six down. So every fraction is there. And what you do is do the old diagonal count again. And you put them in room one, two, three, four, five. And here they are here. Room one gets a half, uh, one, a half, two, a third. You get a duplicate two. Doesn't matter if you have an empty room. Doesn't matter. We know that. Three. So, so basically, by just going up the diagonals through all of these, you will get every fraction and put everyone in a room. So they are actually countable. So Cantor was wrong there. You think there's lots of fractions, but they're the same number. And he thought, okay, algebraic numbers. Everybody remembers your high school maths. An algebraic number is just any number made out of plus, minus, divide, times, and, and a root. I, I made these up. Root two is a, a, a simple one. But those top two and the one on the left, that's just junk I made up. But they're algebraic numbers. They can be as stupidly complex, or as idiotic as you want, but they're still an algebraic number. Cantor thought, okay, there must be so many of them jammed into the number line everywhere that there must be more than infinity of them. No, he was wrong again. Because there's a trick. This is the only bit of high school maths slide in the whole presentation. Every one of those numbers, like this one here, this weird fifth root of 99 I made up, is actually the root of this polynomial. You remember your quadratic polynomials? You probably drew, drew quadratics and that sort of thing. This is just a polynomial with 10 tenths degree one. So what you do is he, he just simply, that's from Ferris Bueller, this guy. He's the guy who bored everybody. What you do is you just count the polynomials that correspond to the um, algebraic numbers and they're all countable. So he was wrong there and he was about to give up, but he, he succeeded. He invented, uh, it's, look, it's too, I, I don't have time to explain how he did it because that's really getting into the heavy maths. He, did, he, he, he concocted an infinity called RLF1, which is bigger than RLF0. He actually, so at this point, um, Buzz Lightyear is broken, right? Because there is, there actually is an infinity bigger than our normal, you know, infinity. And I'll explain it in a second. And that, and it's legitimate. I just quoted some reputable websites here that talk about LF1. Now, I'll, I'll tell you what it is in a second. And this is uh, a history book of mine that explains how we turned LF0 into LF1. But that's just to prove that I'm not pulling your legs. Right? <laughs> there is a proof. But I'll, I'll explain what's going on. The whole idea is that if a bus rolled up, with RLF1 people in it, they, couldn't, they could not get into Hilbert's Hotel because it's an infinity bigger than that infinity of rooms. You'd fill it up with an infinity of people and there'd be another infinity waiting and more and more and more because that infinity is actually bigger than Hilbert's Hotel's infinity. And this is where Buzz Lightyear's um, infinity and beyond the joke starts. Now, <laughs> It gets worse. Cantor realized if I can concoct this RLF1, which is bigger than that one, this infinity is bigger than that one, I can do it again using the same technique. And again and again. So what he did was Cantor actually astonished all his com compatriots and they were actually rather upset with him. He discovered an infinite tower of infinities, each one bigger than the one before. So if you had a hotel with RLF3 rooms in it, and a bus rolled up with RLF four people in it, they won't go in because it's bigger. Okay, we're getting close now. I just want to take you back to the number line which you saw before. We all we've all seen the number line probably since we we're in primary school. Well, you know, when you, you draw different numbers on it and you make Cuisinier rods and things and join them up, do you remember those things? Yeah. Every number is on the line somewhere. I picked those ones out of a hat. Oh, famous ones, this pi and e, you know, and a half. So the question is, oh, that's right. I, I mentioned a slide rule here because I loved having a slide rule when I was a kid because it reminded me of the number line. And of course, no one in their right mind these days would still use a slide rule. What? 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 Give me the microphone. <laughs> Wow. No real engineer would be seen dead without a slipstick in his hand. 
<laughs> and it's even got it's got all those lovely logs on the back too. Look at that, it's fantastic. That's yeah. a triple scale log. Yeah, you can borrow that. Have a, oh, have pass a, it around. Go, have a, oh, pass it around. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a so it's a lovely way of representing the number line. That's a logarithmic number line on those on those slide rules. I here. keep a regular plastic one on my desk, not the lovely bamboo one. Yeah. <laughs> the circular one too. Oh yeah, well, one, oh dumb stat and the head is dumb stat. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, okay. Aristo, Aristo. Yeah. yeah. And when you take the um, slide out under, underneath on the back, are all the formulas from my math exam. All right. <laughs> all right, better race through. Was there? But the point is, Cantor wanted to know if every number that exists is on this line somewhere. He wanted to know. Well, here's an example. I picked the square root of 10 because that's one of my favorite numbers for historical reasons. It's on the line here, and it's an infinite decimal point. So somewhere on this line is the square root of 10, and it must be infinitely small. It effectively takes no room. I mean, we, we, we have this concept of a, a line is made up of points. We, we sort of say that casually, but how? So this is, this means, Hang on now, this is, this is interesting. Cantor wanted to know how many numbers are there actually on the line? Well, the answer is there's obviously a lot, right? I will skip over this, but before Cantor's theory came in, there was a lot of confusion about what lines actually were. Like this quadratic crosses the axis here at around 2.4 or something. But, but nobody actually knew how. It was like Zeno and um, Achilles and the tortoise. If you zoom down in there and there further and further and further, when does it actually cross? How many numbers are there? Like you just get closer and closer and the numbers get closer and closer, but they get closer and closer forever. How do you cross the line? So this was a paradox that had mathematicians puzzled for ages. And this is, now this, this is, this is a bit of a trick here. Cantor discovered that if you take any piece of the number line, just say that bit there, zero to one for convenience, and this bit zero to 10 for convenience. He discovered that the number of numbers in there is the same number of numbers in there. It sounds stupid. It's like, it's like having a one liter cup of water and a 10 liter cup of water and they have the same amount of water in them. Seriously, it makes no sense whatsoever because every number in between zero and one has a corresponding one exactly between zero and 10. Like a half goes to five. And the reverse, one goes back to one tenth. And you can go down as small as you want. So this is the point of this is that this really, oh, sorry, I could go back one. This really confused people that any piece of the number line, any piece, nobody big, even an infinite piece of it has the same number of numbers in it. It's completely counterintuitive. My headset's falling off. Hang on a second. And this really confused people. Oh, I can hear myself better now too. It slipped off. Sorry about that. Don't be frightened by this. Uh, people at home probably can't read this. But what happened was Cantor thought, I want to prove that the number of numbers on the number line can't be counted. So they, they won't fit in the hotel. And he did this experiment, a mental experiment, because you can't do this. Remember, it's just maths, not physics. Write down every number. It'll go for infinity over there and down there. Every number. Then go down the diagonal numbers here I've colored. And every time you hit one, add one to it. So the nine actually wraps around to zero. The three goes to four, four to five. So you just do that. You go down the diagonal forever, adding one to each number you hit on the way down the diagonal and write out the result along the top there in yellow. If you do that for, an inf for infinity, you'll get an infinitely long decimal number at the top. But this is the mental trick here. That number you've concocted up here will differ from every number in this list by at least one digit because you flipped a digit. So what happens is the number you concocted is not in this list. You've used a list to make a number which isn't in its own list. Therefore, the list is incomplete. You cannot count the real numbers, the, the number of numbers on the line. 
he called this number C. It's actually, a, a, and sorry for, for computer geeks, it's called the Fracture small C. It's actually a Unicode character, it's this character here. And he calculated that it's actually equal to two to the power of infinity. <laughs> now, that sounds, you know, I mean, that, I knew people would be frightened by this. You say, what the hell is two to the power infinity? It's the number of numbers, but it's actually quite simple. Two to the one is combinations of one thing. Two things, three things. So every time, so two to the four is, I didn't, I ran out of graphics, but two to the fifth is every combination of five things, 120 some, 128 things or something like that. You just keep going. So he, he proved that uh, two to the power of our infinity, our infinity, naught, that's our infinity, our popular one, is equal to this number of the continuum, the, the number of real numbers on the number line. And the, the concept is pretty boggling, but what you've done is, is actually make every combination of every imaginable number. Now, he won't, Cantor couldn't figure out where C was in this stack of infinities he invented. He thought it was this one. So he thought the number of, nu the number of numbers on the number line was Aleph one, but he couldn't prove it. And it turns out it's not proven to this day. And it's one of the great outstanding problems in mathematics. Some people think it's Aleph two. There's some evidence. Most mathematicians think he is right. It, uh, it's that one, no prize for it. And, and if you think you can sit here tonight and solve it, there's bad news because in 38, Kurt here proves that the, the continuum hypothesis can be true. It doesn't break any rules if it's true. In 63, Paul here proves that if it's not true, it also doesn't break the rules. So this continuum hypothesis can be both true and false. Yes, serious trouble there, which means that the hypothesis might be actually outside of mathematics. It's a meta-mathematics. So now okay, we're almost there. We saw before that you can make, a, Cantor made these stacks of infinities, each, each one bigger and bigger and bigger. You can actually go to absurd lengths. You can make an infinity, an infinity of infinities of infinities. And then you can have an inf infinite number of a stack of infinities of infinities. <laughs> this, these numbers are now, these are now preposterous sizes of infinity, but they're valid. They actually make sense. They are valid mathematics. So I'm trying to default, let this thing drop off my head. So I think I've got a slide left now. And you think it ends there? Check this out. Thanks to this fabulous guy here, Michael, from the Vsauce tube. As an axiom that there exists some next number so big, is no point. amount of replacement or power setting on anything smaller could ever get you there. Such a number is called an inaccessible cardinal because you can't reach it from below. So there are infinities so large you can't reach them. And that's at the bottom of this chart here. But mathematicians have found there are even bigger infinities going all the way up this stack. It's out of my territory. This is a complicated set theory. So these are some of the best guys in the world who are working on this. But the bit that worries me is the very far top left. If there's some sort of set up there where zero equals one, that means that mathematics has actually broken down. You're, you're in an infinity where maths is no longer valid or it's a different set of axioms that we don't understand. So this is what we've learned about big numbers, really big numbers, ridiculous numbers, infinity, our infinity that we all know and love, as, I, as I've said, that's the RLF naught or the, our infinity symbol. Cantor's tower of infinities, his stack of infinities going out and out and out forever. And there's the, is these inaccessible infinities and beyond which um, as I've said here, I'm not qualified to explain, unfortunately. So no questions about uh, infinite cardinals, please. <laughs> so, and, and notice here, I use Comic Sans font. I think it's the only time it's valid to use it. Try and wind everybody down, you know? <laughs> so, so there you go. All right, okay. Remain seated, no, no standing ovations, please. Thank you, Greg. Are there any, we'll start off in the room. Are there any questions in the room that anyone would like to ask of Greg? I'm getting nervous now. 
because I'm actually a computer programmer, not a mathematician. Yeah, so I'm not a be, mathematician be, be, either. I can be kind you. to me. Yeah, no, right. no, no. I'm, I can't remember how to solve a quadratic even these days. Yeah. But I, ha I have to ask Greg, with all this mathematics, at what point is there a point, a finite point, where it ceases to have practical application? Practical, yes. In the world of physics, in the physical world, the very first infinity, our infinity, Aleph naught, has no practical use, no practical use. Uh, they have theoretical uses. I should point out that Aleph naught is very popular in mathematics. You see infinity symbols everywhere. Aleph one does pop up in a few specialist places. There are certain sets and certain, certain special branches of maths where they know that this thing has Aleph one things in it. But after that, they're all out of Cantor's imagination and all the set theorists. No practical use whatsoever. Right. Yeah. A supplementary question to that. What is the mathematical basis then of the warp drive? The warp drive? Well, mine's down in the... I put it into the parking spot. It said reserved for guest speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, it just fit. Right. Oh, that was... That's your, <laughs> that would be in that slide I showed you back at the start which said, is the universe infinite? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a... Is that you or me? Oh. I think because that. Oh. Yeah. I think I'm under a speaker. That's what the problem was. Yeah. Um, just a, first of all, you've made me very happy that I chose engineering rather than mathematics as my <laughs> field of expertise. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the uh, universe yeah. that may well be uh, infinite, yeah. and uh, we've been able to recently uh, see or be aware of some objects that are 13 and a half billion light years away and that's the furthest we've seen thanks, but, to, but, thanks to a new telescope yeah yes. <laughs> well, thanks to all that but uh, there's also an understanding that the universe is about 13 and a half or thereabouts billion years of old of age so anything that's further away than 13.5 light years, the light from there hasn't yet had the time to get to Earth from the beginning of the universe. Yes, it's beyond the light horizon. It's beyond the light horizon. Yeah. So we, we just have to wait another billion years to see if there's something that's uh, 14 billion light years away. No, I've got bad news. The universe is expanding. So, so things are moving beyond the commoving distance so if you see a distant galaxy and try to fly to it, you know, in, in the Enterprise, by the time you get there, it'll be gone. Yeah. It's interesting because that means if the universe is infinity, infinite, it's going to be bigger than that soon. Yes, the current, the best estimates at the moment are that the universe, the experts wish to believe that it's not infinite because there would be some serious problems if it were both philosophical and math and physical um, we believe that the, the universe is, uh, there's more of it beyond the light horizon, but we don't know how much. So, um, some people think the universe might be what's called a three manifold, which is actually like a Mobius strip, which if you go out one end, you'll come in the other side like a, like a, like a torus. But, but, but as far as we've measured so far, the bad news is that the universe appears to be completely flat. There's no curvature detected to the far as we can go so either we haven't looked far enough yet like it's like the ant sitting on the uh on the on, you know, on the on the baseball everything looks flat to him oh us sitting on the earth i should say you know it looks flat so maybe maybe where the universe we haven't seen far enough to see any curvature yet and it's a serious philosophical problem too if the universe is actually infinite like that book of babel by george has had there with every combination of every letter in it it would mean if the universe is infinite in every direction, forever, infinite, somewhere out there, there's going to be a recurrence. There'll be another room with people like us sitting in it. And even an infinite number of them, because all the atoms, there's only so many atoms, 10, 10 to the 50 atoms in the Earth. Somewhere out there, there's going to be, because it's infinite, there's going to be another Earth or something very close to it. There could be another room out there somewhere in the universe where we're all sitting here and we've all got three eyes and I'm the Pope. 
Seriously, I mean, this is no philosophical joke because if you rearrange all the atoms, they're going to come together in some form. It's very frightening. There could be an evil me out there. <laughs> um, of all these uh, pretty clever mathematicians, do you know if any of them were married or had girlfriends? Oh, I should it have had a... It seems like they... I've done yeah. another... I did a talk... Um, to the Morty skeptics about four or five years ago, and I had a a, a tile a tiling a tile up, like a like a like a Zoom guest tile pictures of all the famous mathematicians. And I think I said at the time, that's a bunch of pretty bad blind dates. <laughs> they, <laughs> I, they, they, I think they all had families and stuff. I know Gauss actually had people immigrate to America. But there's uh, there's some uh, <clears throat> ramifications of this in evolution terms. Yeah. Because it means that if mathematics mathematicians are not reproducing, um, does that mean we're running out of clever mathematicians, yeah. or do they sprout from nothing? I highly sort of recommend you, you watch a movie called Idiocracy, where <laughs> only only the dumb people are reproducing. I uh, yeah. <laughs> say no more. Oh, someone's seen it. That's right. Yeah. Obviously, one of my hobbies is movies. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Zoomland. We haven't heard from Zoomland. We think they're all muted. No, there's one there. John Thompson, you've got a question? Yes, I'd, uh, I most enjoyed, really enjoyed that talk, but I'd like to uh, know what the speaker's advice would be if he had a grandson who said that he wanted to be, become a mathematician. Oh, well, remember, I'm a computer programmer. There's a lot of overlap with good computer programmers have a lot of overlap with maths because we use a lot of algorithms and stuff. I think the first thing, my first suggestion would to be to be autistic. <laughs> well, that stunned the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so no, you'd, no. you'd think within the universe, <laughs> the universe, there's room for a few more mathematicians. Oh, yes, I'm working on some myself. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> Clive, Clive Maynard. Ah, uh, hi. Uh, just thought I'd uh, put up a background of Asher there. So, you know, we're there, we've got infinite regression going there. Uh, Asher is the artist to, to, to do this sort of stuff for us. Oh, I love Anybody the guy. Yeah. I guess you can there. Any other Asher fans? Anybody wave your hands? Yeah, there's a, oh, there's a few going up. Yeah. He was way ahead of his time, like Dali. It was the first time people saw Dali's paintings, they were fainting. And uh, I just thought, just as a throwaway line, since you started talking about uh, old programming languages you'd worked with at the beginning, uh, here is a, uh, I don't know, with that background, I can't show it. It's the art of Lisp programming. Lisp was the second high level language. Oh, Lisp is very influential, very well respected. And uh, I'm very happy to say I'm one of the authors of that book. Good grief. There you go. Oh, sir. So... <laughs> <laughs> no, have to say that. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll come to that one. Yeah. This was one of the few languages I haven't written. I've done Algol, Fortran, COBOL, 360 Assembler, C Sharp, F Sharp, VB, and others I can't remember. I taught COBOL. Uh, that is not something you wish to admit. <laughs> Can you erase that from the video? <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, uh, there's no further questions. Um, I'd just like to make a few observations. Uh, sadly, my parents have uh, departed this life because I'd have to go home and tell them that uh, in 1945, when they sent me to Warrnambool Primary School, I learned none of this. Um, so uh, either my education was neglected uh, or it was a pretty awful school to go to. But uh, look, thank you very much. 95% uh, uh, of it was over my head. Um, I'm a very simple man. But on behalf of the members, I'd just like to give you a small gift. And it happens to be just a bottle of wine. Now, I have to tell you, it is finite. 
It's only five glasses in it. It's not an infinity glass of a bottle of wine. So it will eventually run out. But thank you very much. So now for those uh, here, we're breaking for uh, 30 minutes, which will make it uh, 20 to 9. And uh, I believe there's some light entertainment for you at home. If you'd have come, you'd have been party to our party. We'll all be happy and merry in half an hour's time. Those of you, again, that haven't bought a raffle ticket, uh, Choi's somewhere around that she'll quite happily take your money. And we'll see you all in 30 minutes. Thanks. So now I'd like to welcome our uh, president, um, Hugh, you're on. He's just having some sustenance uh, to go through this uh, big moment. Thanks, Peter. Is it? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, <clears throat> good evening, everyone, and um, good evening to everyone on Zoom as well. So, um, <laughs> everyone who's um, come along here tonight, uh, thank you very much for <clears throat> making the effort to, to come along. And um, <clears throat> to um, to all members, um, it's the, the first meeting of the year, so um, so happy new year to everyone, and I hope you all had a, a great um <clears throat> holiday period and summer and um it's all been good for you um so yeah so we're back at uh Moorabbin tonight doing a, a hybrid meeting um and so um so it's taken a bit of work to um to get everything running again as far as these meetings go so um i'd like to um Talk about what we've done and, and thank you to you people um who have um played a big part in contributing to, to putting this together this meeting tonight first of all um to the the guest speaker we had um greg Kerr. he was a excellent uh speaker first <laughs> off of the year so um even though he's gone home thank you very much to to greg um <clears throat> we started off obviously by um organizing him so um David, Sonia Gibson, and um, and Kirsten Greed um, have uh, played a big role in organising Greg to come along and um, <clears throat> for the first uh, time, um, we have uh, Kirsten back to to uh, <laughs> help with organising speakers. So that's been tremendous. Um, we've had to do a lot of uh, testing of the AV system uh, to get it working. So um, Quite a few people have been involved in that. We've had um, Stuart Grunnickley's uh, spent a lot of time uh, doing that. Uh, John Swale as well. Uh, Rob Brown, who who can't be here tonight. So a big thank you to all of them, and also to Chris Hayes, um, who um, you know is the the master um, expert of this system. And uh, so uh, on the weekend on, on Sunday. Um, he especially came down from Churchill, where he lives, to, to give us a hand with um, some bugs that we'd identified in the system and spent quite a bit of time here. So um, thank you very much to him. And um, <clears throat> we've had uh, Phil and, and Brian um, come in and, and help with the refreshments. So um, thank you very much to them. They're on, on, ongoing volunteering for this um, and to Choi for um, her efforts with the the raffle and um, everything else she does. <clears throat> so yeah, so I think that uh, covers everyone. Hopefully, I I haven't forgotten everyone. So um, yeah, thank you all again. And um, yeah, obviously, um, you know, we'll continue to have these uh, hybrid meetings. And um, 
So yeah, we've had a, a small turnout tonight and a, a much bigger turnout on Zoom. Um, and hopefully uh, as the months go on, people become <clears throat> familiar once again. <clears throat> oh, man. <clears throat> With, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, as they become familiar once again with uh, coming along to Rabin, um, we uh, get more and more attendees. Um, so um, we, yeah, we have some, uh, you know, plans for um, other, <clears throat> other events uh, this year. Um, some more um, in-person stuff here at Rabin. So, um, you know, as the months go on, um, we will um, announce uh, more around that as we finalize those plans as well. So, um, you know, one of my aims as president was to get uh, a lot more happening at Rabin. So hopefully that is something that we will achieve as the year goes on. Um, other than that, just uh, I think the only other real thing of note that I'll mention uh, Last night we had uh, an email go out about uh, the uh, the rules, and uh, we're looking at um, updating the rules. And uh, it invited members to log in to our discourse uh, online forum system. Um, <clears throat> there've been some issues today in doing that, and uh, the issues um, have now been fixed. So if you try and log on, say last night. Um, or early this morning, then, um, and you couldn't get on, then uh, the situation has now improved. So please try and do that again. Um, that's really all I have to say tonight. So once again, thank you to everyone for coming along, and uh, I'll see you all next month. Sorry, I was going to. Is anyone, has anyone got any questions? If you have a question, um, I'm happy to answer any questions, either from, from here or from Zoom. Anyone have any anything they want to ask? Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, and I'll see you next month. Thanks for that, Hugh. Just a, just a minor tip, you. You say any questions, if the hands don't go up, you're out. You get out of here quick. <laughs> but I see someone has got their hand up, but uh, you've gone. So uh, um, two hands went up, but they've gone. Not to worry. So now I'd like to pass over to Stuart Grunnickley. He's the I help man this month uh, to give you a few uh, bit of information on what I help is doing. And uh, if time permits he might ask some of those answer some of those curly questions so over to you uh, Stuart thank you Peter um I'll start off by saying I don't really have anything much prepared so I, I'd like to throw it open to questions firstly I hope I help is um is as you know our means of assisting our members completely free of charge naturally because we pay our annual membership and therefore should be able to get some benefit from that and um, we work on a, a volunteer basis that is the i help team work on a volunteer basis covering five days a week between 10 a.m and 3 p.m uh, unfortunately, you can't actually talk directly to us by ringing. Uh, you have to ring and leave a message and we call back. That's just the, one of the foibles of our telephone system because we all work from home and it, um, it's no longer possible for us to switch the telephone system to the individual that's on duty at the time. However, we usually do call back very promptly if you leave a message, that message comes through as an email to all of the iHelp team. And if one team member's not available or the another one thinks that it's something that's really uh, 
in his interest to answer, then that's that's the way we work. It's a, a fairly cooperative kind of um, situation that we find ourselves in. So has anybody got any particular issues that we might be able to solve in the next uh, seven minutes or less? <laughs> I believe I've only got another seven minutes left. No questions here. What about uh, on the World Wide Web? No, nothing there? Excellent. Right. <laughs> John Thompson. John Thompson. Uh, Stuart, uh, I think you should uh, mention the uh, chat uh, facility because the computer help in there seems to be very active and uh, some some people may not be aware of it. By chat facility, do you mean the spaces? Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. That is an extremely good and very welcome replacement of our old um, uh, news groups and then followed by Yammer. Um, spaces now is the place to go to to get answers about anything in, in life. Uh, particularly in the chit chat area, but we do have other specialist groups like Linux and um, email issues and computer issues. And if you have a problem and it's out of hours, then um, just, you know, out of the hours of 10 through to three, say, then just simply put your question on spaces on the appropriate group we have about, oh, I don't know, a dozen, two dozen groups of various subjects. And usually you'll get an answer within minutes, maybe hours, maybe days, depends on the, the strength of your question <laughs> and how difficult it is for people to answer. But um, I've made use of that in that way myself, not being on top of every particular issue to do with computers, particularly Linux. I recently started up using Linux Mint and I've had a, a huge amount of help from the people on the, the Linux group on um, spaces. But if you've got email problems, put them there. Uh, by all means, contact, you know, ring up uh, iHelp on 9276 4088 leave a message there we'll call you out we'll call you back during the week uh, and uh, that's just another avenue for you to get answers to your questions that's one of the benefits the very good benefits of being a member of melbourne pc user group peter carpenter's got a question or a comment stuart peter yes stuart yes i just thought i'd mention that i help uh helped a couple of um, members in the last month or so just you know on the back channel just because they happen to live close and one of them i found on two of his machines had been talked into subscribing to trend micro antivirus and uh, paid 300 odd dollars for a subscription to that and as well had um, another antivirus uh, at, <laughs> installed on both machines at the same time so uh, it took a you know a bit of effort to get both of them off and um, off both machines and then just uh, invoke um, Windows Own Defender to run it. And of course, they had a number of other automatic startup uh, programs that um, contributed to slowing the machine down, which was the, uh, the problem in the first place. So, um, you know, once again, be careful of who you speak to on the phone and who um, who asks you for money. Usually the advice should be no. Uh, <laughs> you know, the response should be no. Uh, um, I'll just mention one other little thing I had on my Dell screen, 27 inch, it served me well for quite a while. Half of it started flashing sideways and uh, it looked as though it might have exhausted its life but um i powered the um powered the screen off removed the uh, the power cord 
removed all the um, connectors and then, um, fill, you know, um, filled with them to get them back into their sockets because, you know, metal connections corrode and uh, tried it at both ends, you know, the computer and the screen and uh, fired it up again and it's uh, returned like new. So when you think uh, something's broken, it, uh, it may well not be. And uh, it's worth just a little bit of attention to um, try to get it back into working order. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That's a couple of good, very good uh, hints. Um, I've come across a number of uh, members who have multiple, uh, as you've found, multiple uh, antivirus and good things, they say, and just give them money. But um, their Windows Defender, I, in my view anyway, Windows Defender is, is quite adequate for most purposes. Yeah. Uh, I suggest just putting uh, uh, malware bytes, the free version, onto your PC and only running it when you choose to run it. Don't have it running in the background. Um, as most of those other ones do, and they by running in the background, they tend to slow your computer down considerably. Yep. Question? That's a very in interesting topic, and I'm just wondering if it could be a subject for a talk here at one time, expanding on... Uh, you know, antivirus, antivirus. And all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I contribute, I, I subscribe to Norton 360, but I'm not completely sure that I need to. How good is Defender? Well, so it, people will have those sorts of questions. It, it really be. depends on how much money you've got <laughs> or want to spend. Uh, and, you know, some are better than others, mm. but they seem to leapfrog quite a bit. So, yes. you know, this month it'll be McAfee. Next month it'll be maybe something else. Uh, Defender seems to be about the middle of the pack mm. or lower. But what do you really need? Well, most there's... most of the scams that take place nowadays are aimed at you being taking some action, taking some action, right. giving something that you shouldn't be, <laughs> not just money but personal details. Yes. Um, and being tricked mm. rather There's, than having a, a virus as such. Right. Some of the uh, programs provide other facilities like you know, Norton wants you to pay extra money to stop people tracking you. Whether mm. that's necessary or not, I don't know. But, but maybe somebody who's right up with the whole thing could turn this into a, to a talk for one of our meetings. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I got an email from my gov today and I looked at uh, where it came from and it certainly wasn't my gov. It's uh, it's marvellous, you know, what's out there. I've got a friend, he's a bit older than mine, he, a super intelligent man, but he I don't know whether he or his wife got the text message, hi mum, I've lost my phone or something. <laughs> I had to pay a bill, $11,100. He couldn't get to his bank account quick enough to pay it. And uh, when he's, uh, he got a second one asking for another 6000 and his wife turned up at that stage and she said, I, I'm not happy with this. Let's ring our daughter. And she said, hi, what are you ringing for? And he was fortunate that um, the, uh, he's with Westpac and he rang Westpac up and they said, because it's an external transfer from one bank to another, it'll take a while. So they stopped it. But they said if it was Westpac to Westpac, it would have gone straight through. But, you know, he, you know, he's little, she's 52, his daughter, but she was up in Sydney and, uh, oh, she must be in trouble. I'd better help. It, you know, it's just surprising um, how they manage to do things. My uh, wife tells the story that um, when the phone rings, uh, we found if you pick it up and there's no one there, it's usually if you wait a few seconds, it's someone from India wants to talk to you. So she hangs up. 
This happened two or three times. In the end, she got a text message from her daughter-in-law. Why do you keep hanging up on me? So I think my wife talked a way out of that. Stuart, uh, I'd be interested in your opinion, please. Um, I help a number of widows and widowers and pensioners um, with their computing and, uh, you know, probably a, a major focus on their, their hardware and keeping their systems operating and cleaned and protected and, and all sorts. But one of the things that really jumps out at me, and, and these are all members of, of LPC, one of the things that jumps out at me is we've had so much change in our core systems and applications, etc., that predominantly they've been left behind. And they're saying, ah, uh, you know, do we really need Mel PC? And the more people I talk to, the more I, I, I start hearing this that people are you know, starting to, to distance. And I'm wondering whether, I don't know, some, some fairly basic um, information systems might be prepared and, and presented to try and bring these people back into the fold and yes, no, your, I your agree, opinion. I agree entirely with you on that, Colin. Um, is Kirsten taking some notes on that? <laughs> well, come up here and say it. <laughs> My time's up. Oh, okay. Um, all right, I'll come up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is it, oh, will we get, do I need to switch? I, I had this tweet handy and it's, on Twitter, so it must be right. This guy, his name's Nathan Alabak, and um, he's a marketer. But he goes, um, technology has advanced so fast the past 20 years that much of our elders' wisdom, or how it's communicated, has become stale. So younger people now go to other younger people who can communicate better for guidance, but they're also less wise and are often selling something. That's my answer to that. <laughs> thank you, Kirsten, and thank you, Stuart. Um, you've answered all the questions brilliantly. Um, lucky that they told you what the questions were. But I don't know whether Hugh's still around, but I see a couple of committee members. Maybe there's a bit of a hint there that um, from a couple of the members that maybe we get back to some of the basic stuff and... And someone suggested, you know, just to talk one night on some of the simple things that uh, obviously there's people out there making mistakes and some of the stuff's a bit beyond them. So uh, just a thought. So I'm not sure what the time is, but uh, we'll close the formal meeting. I think Zoom will be left open for a few minutes for anyone that wishes to have a bit of a chit chat. And uh, good night to everyone. And we'll see you all next month on the 1st of uh March because it's a uh, leap year, 28 days. So it's exactly four weeks from tonight. It's easy to remember. So thanks for those of you that attended. I hope you enjoyed the night and the lavish supper that put on, which would make all those people at home jealous that they weren't here. And we'll see you all next month. <laughs>